Namaskaram. I want to start first by thanking Apurva for making me part of Navadisha, a wonderful novel concept curated by this absolutely wonderful dancer, bringing together new thoughts, fresh perspectives, new ideas in the field of dance. It's quite intimidating actually to talk about dance. It's much easier to dance itself. <laughs> but the topic that Apurva invested with me actually set me thinking because my foray into the world of North Indian bhakti or Shringara poetry had never been a consciously thought out move to sort of experiment. It was something that I grew up with by being the daughter of uh, my mother and guru, Srimati Jamuna Krishnan. Any language is a window to a specific culture. It enables one to look at the society, its customs, geography, the relationship among men and women, the, sh the social practices, food, music, dance, etc. As a result, the study of different languages other than one's own is always a very enriching experience. At this point, I want to just take you back a couple of decades to when my maternal grandparents actually moved out of bustling Mumbai way back in 1942 and came down to settle in Delhi. And at that time, the North-South divide was actually more vast and more pronounced than even the divide between India and the Aboriginals, I think, today. And the South Indian was looked upon as a great piece of conversation. He was seen as an alien up in the North, where he was sort of placed alongside the Punjabis. And everything about him, the food, the complexion, the language that we spoke, the way we ate, the clothes that we wore, everything seemed to be a topic of conversation. So this was the kind of milieu that my mother actually grew up in way back in the early 40s. My maternal grandparents did make adjustments and shifts in normal living, and this was hugely challenging to say the least. It has been to my tremendous advantage and blessing that my grandparents and later on my mother made this very, very important, as I say, cultural shift. Because while Tamil Carnatic music was being practiced and spoken at home, the language that was used in school and in the neighborhood amongst friends in society was always Hindi. So taking on to Hindi, getting a hold of the language, developing a taste in it, was not something that was far-fetched for my mother. But at the same time, the pull of formal education sort of moved her away from practicing Hindi as a language for education. And it was much later in life when, as a professor of economics, she opted to teach first-generation learners of economics in Hindi. So because she chose to teach economics in a medium other than English, she obviously had to go deeper into studying the language. Surrounded by friends and colleagues from the Hindi literature department in the university, moving into poetry, moving into literature, moving into other kinds of Hindi texts, it was not just like, you know, the rapid English speaking course, so how do you speak Hindi in 15 days, but it was more that she wanted to get a grasp of the language. So you end up doing that best when you read poetry, you read literature, you read works of other authors, and then sort of get a hold or move into the depth of a particular language. Her training in Bharatanatyam continued side by side, her training in traditional Bharatanatyam. 
And very interestingly, one of her very close friends who was a poetess in Delhi and who used to come regularly to see the Bharatanatyam performances one day told Amma that, you know, you have these beautiful padams, love poetry, which you explore in Tamil or Telugu. There is something very similar in the North, penned by Vidyapati. And that was a time when Amma did not even know the spelling of Vidyapati, leave alone the language. And the language that Vidyapati wrote is in Maithili, very different from Braj Bhasha used uh, by Surdas Ji. And at that same time, our Guru Kalanadi Mami was commissioned to do a project by the Sangeet Narak Academy alongside Rohini Bhateji in Kathak. And Rohini Bhateji, because the two were working together and they were in Delhi and our home was another home for Mami whenever she would come to Delhi, Rohini Bhateji would always tell her that you have these gems in Bharatanatyam which you can just sort of take up and do in Sringara. But we unfortunately, other than our Thumris, we really don't have much of a wider repertoire to sort of delve into in terms of our language. And my mother as a young learner very timidly shared a particular Vidyapati song and said, I read this, so why don't you try doing this in Kathak? And it was the magnanimity of Rohini Ji that she set that to music and performed it in the same stage as Mami. And that set the first ignition spark sort of moving when Amma thought that if she could delve into another poetic ocean, why can't I? And there began this very long journey of exploring Bharatanatyam through another syntax, another language, very alien to us because Maithili Bhraj Bhasha is not something, even the poetic Hindi that is used in Meera, which is very, very flavorful of Rajasthan and Mewar, that region, is not something that you really speak at home, even though you are born and bred in the North. The beauty of exploring these works was never centered to doing it for one performance, or it was never geared up just to sort of do it as a project, or do it for one evening, or it has to get condensed into that two-hour format. But the idea of exploring the poetry was that one needed to delve into every possible poetic interpretation that the poet has to offer. And there began unraveling, as I said, these absolute, absolute gems in poetry. Very interestingly, during the exploration of Vidyapati, when Amma was working very closely with Kalanadi Mami, Mami herself at that time was amazed and astounded that a parallel world to Kshetraya existed in the north and there were so many shades of Sringara, Vidyapati being absolutely the master of Shringara. The beauty of the language at this point I would like to say is that many a times the poetic expressions are so succinct, they are so pregnant with meaning that no matter how much you try during the process of teaching or translation, you can't ever find a substitute word for that particular word which the poet has used to describe a particular situation. The challenge has always been, I feel, to understand the language in its entirety. So be it Vidyapati who explores Sringara in its diverse shades, his favorite being the relationship between Radha and Krishna, 
two surdas where actually the madhurya bhakti of surdas ji comes out so beautifully when he was initiated into the krishna cult by madhavacharya and he i believe penned the entire bhagavata after hearing it from his guru madhavacharya it was it before that it was believed that he used to lament about his own misfortunes as he was born blind but it was madhavacharya who told him listen to the to the beauty of krishna and all will be well and that is how the entire 10 sections of sursagar were actually written by surdas ji the other very interesting aspect of this poetry is that surdas ji's sursagar is a geeti kavya it was sung so if you read the sursagar volumes there are two huge volumes every little pada of sursagar actually has the name of the traditional raga written alongside that ragas which must have been used and which sort of fell out of practice and the different shades of krishna be it krishna as a child with which surdas ji is eternally obsessed to a very interesting concept in surdas ji which as amma explored it in her research works opened up an ocean of possibilities in terms of the dancing language was a very unique concept known as epiphany in sur's poetry where the godliness of the little child remains unknown to the mother the audience and the author are both privy to his greatness but the mother yashoda remains absolutely unaware of who her child actually is and about the greatness of little krishna a lovely piece that i would like to quote here from this particular section of surdas ji is jabadadhi ripuhari haath liyo hai when krishna the little krishna held on to the hand of his mother who was churning the butter all the gods in the heavens sat up because they thought that the churning of the ocean is going to take place all over again so you can imagine the kind of poetic thought that surdas has actually invested in this situation and there were so many beautiful uh, gems where krishna says मैया मोरी बड़ो करो लोरी दूध दही कृत माखन मेवा प्लीज गिव मी ऑल द बटर एंड कर्ड ओ मैया ओ यशोदा आई वॉन्ट टू ग्रो अप फास्ट बिकॉज वेन आई ग्रो अप फास्ट देन ओनली आई बी एबल टू किल कमसा सो लुक एट दी वंडरफुल इट्स काइंड ऑफ अ सर्कम एम्बुलेशन यू सर्ट ऑफ टेक अ राउंड पाथ एंड यू कम बैक टू वेर यू स्टार्टेड एंड दैट इटर्नल साइकिल सॉर्ट ऑफ continues you have this wonderful composition in krishna karanamritam ramo nama babuva where krishna hears the story of the ramayana from his mother as a lullaby and at the same point when sita has been abducted by ravana he wakes up in absolute distress and shouts lakshmana where is my bow i want to go and kill ravana and that is when the mother is completely distressed she doesn't know what's happened to her little one and she continues remaining unaware till the end but it is only the audience and the author the poet who know about the greatness of the little krishna the parallel piece which we did and it's just lying there like a pearl in the ocean in the poetic works of sur suni sut ek katha kaho pyari the mother says can i tell you a little story and then the entire ramayana unfolds so you have to as i said explore the works in entirety it is not about doing a particular piece it is not about conditioning it or specifying it to 
the challenges or the time frame of a performance but then how do you go beyond that and then select at this point it becomes very important for me to tell you about how we sort of went about doing the music because if you were to set a vidyapati or a sur or for that matter a tulsidas the entire tulsidas ramcharitmanas is set to the chopai style of music singing in ragam desh and the entire cadence of the lines the ups the downs the stretches the chopai itself is a four line little poetic verse and you cannot sort of tamper with the pauses in the poetry because that would sort of mean affecting the the divisions in terms of poetry and would also start affecting the language and what it sort of is trying to say at that point of time if you were to set vidyapati and sur in very classical chaste carnatic ragas like say an abheri or a madhyamavati or a purvi kalyani or a kambodhi personally at that time amma felt that the impact of the poetry or the poetic verse the poetic stresses would sort of get lost it's like hearing an oranga sai in maybe a brindavani or a durga or a desh you would not have that kind of weight to the composition if you were to explore it in a much lighter raga similarly if you were to set the music of meera so the music interestingly when we were doing the music for meera's works for meera's padavali we had to keep in mind that the poetic verses come from the state of rajasthan and there are certain traditional ragas which are used in that state so it could be mand it could be rageshri it could be bageshri and because amma was trained in music all the musical compositions for the different research projects were completely done by her so it was never that 10 verses have been selected you hand it over to a music composer you say now put two jatis put four swaras i want it in this format there were a whole lot of pieces which never sort of lent themselves to any kind of nritta so you could never even think of putting a swara or a tatti mitti or a fast paced jati in the middle of a composition which says i'm wilting in love for you or meera says that a, a beautiful um, thought that comes up in meera is in a composition very less heard where she says it's just four lines of poetry but then you can do that piece for about 15 minutes because there's so much to sort of as i feel explore between the words sovat hi palakame me to palak lagi pal me piv aaye at that time when i slept sovat palakame in my eyelids krishna came at that moment main jo uthi prabhu aadar din ko when i opened my eyes to welcome my lord jag uh, jag kabhi piva dhoond na paaye when i opened my eyes i realized that i had lost my lord so there is so much aur sakhi piva soi gawaye look at all the other sakhis look at all my other friends they lose their beloved when they go to sleep so sleep here is basically used as a metaphor for separation so how do you work within the idiom of bharatanatyam to sort of explore these words is so interesting it's so fascinating because each word brings out multiple possibilities sobat is not just sobat so you can't just show sleeping every time it shows her lack of conscience her lack of consciousness her lack of acknowledging her lack of knowing who krishna is so there are these multiple as i said interpretations that the poetry sort of lends itself to and to weave your way using dance through these words has been the most rewarding uh, experience to say the least another segment of surdas ji 
is a very interesting section titled Murli Samvad, where the flute is believed to be the object of envy by the gopis because of its closeness to Krishna. So the flute is personified as a naika. And there are some beautiful pieces where the flute replies back to the gopis. Main apne bal rehti syama sanga. Tum kahe dukha pavati ri. I am with Krishna on my own strength. Why do you get annoyed? Mo par risa pavati ho puni puni. Again the word risa does not, you translate it very loosely, it means anger. But that anger cannot be really shown as anger, anger. Because the gopis feel jealousy, they feel envy, they feel hurt because of uh, the flute's closeness to Krishna. So the risa actually brings with it these multiple shades of anger, envy, um, even disgust, hurt. They, 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 they want to cry. Why is it that we don't get that kind of closeness to Krishna, which this little bamboo reed gets? And she replies back saying, in the end, I am just a bamboo reed. You have got the most supreme birth as that of the human form. Why is it that I am the one who has to drill sense into your head? Why can't you on your own be just happy with Krishna? It is not so much about choosing or making a conscious choice of using another language for dance as long as the themes, the poetic expressions, and what are the ingredients with which you are actually going to set your dance piece if they are in the right proportions, if they are there with you to sort of start making your dish, I think the dish is going to be delicious to say the least. It doesn't really matter. But very importantly, I want to say that when you start moving into another language, it's very, very crucial that you understand all its nuances. Because sometimes you could be just sort of skipping a word or maybe not giving the right kind of stress there or maybe not understanding the word in its entirety. And that could sort of rob the piece of its main essence. From the Sagun Bhakti of Surdas and Meera where their personal God was Krishna. And there are poems after poems exploring the beauty of Krishna vis-a-vis -vis his relationship with the gopis, vis-a-vis -vis his relationship with Radha, vis-a-vis -vis the pain of separation that is found in Meera. In fact, the entire Padavali of Meera is a viraha pada. It is, there are very few pieces in Meera which actually sort of celebrates her union with Krishna. The rest is a complete poetic work in pining. Moving on and exploring the work of Kabir, a poet like Kabir, who did not believe in any god and he believed in a formless entity or the Nirgun Brahm. There is no form to the Lord and even in his poetry when he says, Hari mera peeva bhai, Hari mera peeva. Complete poetry of ecstasy. Hari bin rahe na sake mera jeeva. Now look at the beauty of the word jeeva. Jeeva doesn't just mean your heartbeat. Jeeva is the entire essence of your being. And Hari in this case is not the Hari. He's not Krishna because... Kabir never believed in God with a form. So Hari is just a poetic expression to denote the divine. And the entire verse, this particular poetic verse, unfolds so beautifully as if it is the relationship between a man and his beloved. So he actually says, Hari mera peeva bhai, Hari ki bahuriya, I am his bride. I am the bride of my Lord. Rama bade, main chuti ki lahuriya. The Lord is great. Again, Ram here is, look at how beautifully he has used both Hari and Ram in the same verse. 
without denoting the physical form of either krishna or rama it's not that kiyo singara milan ki tavi i am bedecked i am waiting for this union kahe na aaye rama gosai why has he not come my beloved ab ki der milan jo paun kahe kabir bho jale nahi aau if i but just once get a glimpse of my lord kabir swears that he will never come back to this material world bho jale nahi aau this world which is full of maya which is full of illusion i don't want to return to it if i just get a glimpse of him this parallel to kabir is seen in another great saint poet from the south ramalinga swami gari again whose poetry is so abstract is so difficult to sort of interpret in dance because it talks about mystical revelation it talks about this mystical union concepts which are very different from the usual nayaka nayika where you as a dancer have mythology you have story you have a background to sort of tell your dance through but in the absence of that when you are dealing with abstract concepts how do you use the dance vocabulary to pave your way through and use the poetry as a vehicle for communication becomes a very very interesting and challenging exercise all of kabir's poetic works again i want to hear time and again say that it is not that one lone piece has been taken up researched set to music and danced when we did the projects the different projects each of them was read several times over and an evening because you have to bring it down to about an hour and a half or two can feature maybe only say six pieces or five pieces but the reading has to go on for about maybe 50 or in the case of uh, surdas ji 500 of them so that you see the various shades that the poet really has to unravel and then you pick out from that as to how you want to go about in terms of your dance interpretation the element of nritta the element of propriety in using nritta while using these or while taking up these um poetic verses has to be done in a very seamless integrated manner so that the poetic verse itself lends to dance movement for example one of meera's very beautiful poems of ecstasy is where she says giridhar aage nachungi main to giridhar aage nachungi very unlike um the viraha poetry of meera but meera seen in her full cry as a very bold woman she says nach nach piva rasika rijhau now the word rasika no matter how much we try to sort of translate it into english for our students back in uh, delhi who don't know poetic hindi so well at the best it only comes to being an equivalent to connoisseur but rasik is so much beyond that rasik is somebody who has the ras for music for dance for love so all this this is why krishna is termed as a rasik by meera and she says nach nach piva rasika rijhau i will in fact when i teach this piece to my students i say meera is rijhauing krishna and then they say what is rijhai so i'm like i can't get the english equivalent to rijhana rijhana is you know at best we can say entice but entice brings with it a a sort of a vampish um, connotation but here the word rijhana is where she is making krishna dance along with her entirety with her being she says lok laj kulaki maryada ya main ek na rakhungi i will not care about the norms laid down by society meera hari rang rachungi i will drown myself in the colors of krishna so what could be 
a poetry of bold feminism if you were to take it even in the modern concept as compared to meera this journey that we have been sort of engaging in and interestingly when i was just eight my mother presented vidyapati's padavali and i was not allowed to dance in that performance because i had not finished my arangetram uh, my own arangetram repertoire consisted of very traditional pieces like sarasi jakshulu idadu padam uh, the varnam was a tamil varnam and at the same time there was a uh, surdas little piece that was taught maiya kabahu padegi choti i was just 10 when i had the arangetram and somewhere uh, the gurus felt that the child is too small to sort of explore shringara or move into the depths of shringara the varnam was a bhakti varnam so why not have a little variety in terms of the abhinaya pieces it's a little krishna who goes and tells his mother look at this you're again and again making me drink this milk and curd telling me that my hair will grow very long you're washing my hair every day but look at it it's still so short so the interpretation or the poetic voice of sur is beautifully expressed through child krishna another po- uh, segment which we dealt with i was much older at that time was a very complex part of surdas ji known as bhramar geet where the entire poem or the entire sequence happens after krishna becomes the king of mathura he has left bridge behind he has left the gopis who were in love with him they continue to pine for krishna and he sends his emissary udho to tell the gopis that they should now have their thoughts moving ahead they should give up thinking about krishna and should now move on to thinking about higher things in life and the entire poetic work unfolds through the voice of the gopis simple village women who say that for us the end all and the be all of our existence all that we have ever known is only krishna so now please don't come and tell us you made us dance around your little finger from the time you were a little boy don't tell us now after so many years to forget you it's not possible the piece also has some beautiful references of krishna now as king of mathura who reminisces his past as a young cowherd in vrindavan look at the kind of poetic variation that is offered to us through these poetic works it is not that it is only about shringara or about virha very similar to kshetriya even in kshetriya the whether it is his poems on sambhoga shringara whether it is his poems on separation like payada or ninnu juchi you can't really categorize them into any one part and say this is all that the padam is trying to tell you because behind as i said the spoken or the the visual world word is this entire world of emotions which are sort of whirling around and which as dancers we have the leeway to sort of flit in and flit out and that personally for me in my own journey studying growing performing developing continuing to work on these pieces has been a an eye opener it's been a completely mind boggling world to say the least the exploration of poetic works of meera surdas vidyapati kabir tulsidas ji has not been incongruous it is not as if i'd created something using spanish or japanese it was something that i had created using languages that i grew up with parallelly moving along with my tamil my telugu and my sanskrit yet i'd say that it has taken me decades to explore study and dance these beautiful works it is the splendor of these works that come to the forefront and i'm happy 
that every time I attempt a work, this happens to me. Towards this end, all means of portraying them need to be intensely developed, whether it's the music, the study of the language, the tala, the choreography, it all has to move, as I said, towards this one direction. In the end, one lifetime proves to be too short, the path too long, full of exciting discoveries, filling each moment of life, making it worth living, worth studying, worth singing, and worth dancing. Namaskaram. I would also take this opportunity of demonstrating three, four very brief segments from pieces. I do have the music with me, just for you to get an idea of how the Abhinaya sort of unfolds because lyrically and poetically there is so much of space that the poet has given within the syntax itself which allows us dancers to sort of explore it in terms of Abhinaya. The first piece that I take up is a composition of Surdasji. It's a very long piece, but I'm just going to um, only do the Pallavi. It is about Rama and Lakshmana in the forest soon after Sita has been abducted. Rama is distraught and he confides to his brother saying, Suno Anuja, listen, O younger brother, this entire forest has conspired Janaki Priya Hari to separate Sita from me. So that is all that the line has. But the kind of emotion that is invested, in fact, as the piece unfolds, every part of Sita's beautiful body Rama says, has been taken away by the forest. So he says that that snake has taken away her long, lovely hair. The bimba fruit has taken away the redness of her lips, the champa flower, the softness of her feet. And in the end, back again, the poet says that looking at the creator himself in this distraught state, Surdas Ji is at a loss for words. He doesn't know how to comprehend this situation because it is unimaginable to see Rama, the Rama, so helpless. So the, the piece is, of course, much longer, but uh, just a very short extract from that.
contrast to the mood of Viraha way back in the 1980s I think it was 80, um, 87 or 88 Mami had been commissioned to do a project on Nayakas in Bharatanatyam and Bragaka, Priyaka my mother, my sister were all part of this project along with Mami and Amma had chosen this particular composition of Vidyapati where a very naughty Krishna makes up his excuse for not coming on time to meet Radha. He says, Suna Suna Sundari, Kara Avadhana. Oh, beautiful woman, listen to me. Kara Avadhana, give me an opportunity to speak. Binu Aparadh, for no fault of mine. Kahasi Kahayan, why are you blaming me like this? Pujalo Pasupati, the entire night, Jamini Jagi, the whole night I was awake praying to Lord Shiva. Gamana Bilamba, Phelatehi Lagi, without any delay, see, as soon as it was morning, I've come back to you. And then he realizes that the telltale marks of being with the other woman are there on him. So he says, Lagala Mriga Mother, Kumkuma Daga, that Mriga Mother, the musk that you see on my face, is because of being the entire night in prayer. Ucharita Mantra, Adhara Nahi Raga. I have been repeating these mantras so many times over and over again that my lips are almost cracking. Rajani Ujagara, the entire night. Because I have stayed up, lochana ghore, my eyes are showing lack of sleep. Tahi lage, tohe mohe. See the wonderful rhyming of the syntax. Tahi lagi, tohe mohe. For no rhyme of reason, you are blaming me. Bolasi chore, you are calling me a thief. So, rajani ujagara lochana ghore. Tahi lagi, tohe mohe, bolasi chore. So even the pace of the lyric sort of lends itself to this mischievous Krishna that is there in this piece. Naba kabi sekhara, ki kahaba toe, sapatha kara hutaba, parati tahoe. I'm promising to you, Naba kabi sekhara is the, um, the poetic voice that comes in. Ki kahabatoe, please listen. Sapata karahu. I'm promising you, doing shapat on you. Taba parati tahoe. Only then will you have a change of heart. So I want to do this piece. It's very short, and I think I will end with that because there's just so much that you can go on and on talking. So um, the, this particular composition of the poet Vidyapati. The music 
the selection of the lyric, setting it to um, music has been done by Guru Jamuna Krishnan. सुन सुन सुंदरे कर अवधान सुन सुन सुंदरे कर अवधान सुन सुन सुंदरे कर अवधान बिनु अपराध कहसी कहे
taking in this experience because it's a subject that's very, very close to my heart. And when Apurva very graciously invited me to speak at Navadisha, I readily accepted. This entire thought process of Navadisha in our home started way back in the 80s because it was an absolutely novel exercise to use alternative poetry. Before that, one odd piece only was being danced by dancers. It could be Hari Tumaharo Janaki Peer, which was very popular of Neera, or Yashoda, Palana, uh, Yashoda Hari Palana Jhulave. But to take up entire works of uh, poets and conceptualize them as alternative margams for Bharatanatyam has been an extremely challenging, rewarding, and an ever-evolving process. Thank you so much for being part of this. Namaskar. Hello. Thank you very, very much. Please join me in thanking Srimati Rakini Chandrasekhar for the presentation. I think it's a good opportunity for us to take some questions. I'm going to request uh, Christopher, who will be our next speaker, to set up in the meantime so that we can uh, you know, use time effectively. But we can open out for questions. Any questions in the audience? We have some mics here. Please. Um. Okay, I would like to start off, if you uh, don't mind. Uh, you did mention, yes, please. Uh, you did mention, you know, when there are specific words, like you were saying, Rijhana, how do you even translate it, yes. you know, while teaching uh, somebody? Uh, the question that I had is, it's words, and the interesting thing is also, with language comes proverbs, oh, yes. which are very, very culture-specific. Oh. So, um, two things. One is, how do you, for instance, if it's Rijhana, what would your choice of gesture in Bharatanatyam, how would you expand, you know, ideas like that? Right. And also, how do you transfer this knowledge when you're teaching? Because you have done the research of the entire body of poem. Correct. But when you teach a student, it's that one poem. And, you know, they, if they're learning Telugu, you know, all of us have learned these languages right. through our dance journey. Right. So. Uh, that's a very interesting question. You know, this brings, uh, this was one used the word Rijhana as part of this um, selection from Neera Spadavali. We did incorporate some Nritta element into it because the poetry allowed us to do that. The poem itself is Giridhar uh, Age Nachungi. So while it was done way back in the early 90s as purely an Abhinaya piece, but in the 2010s and 20s, we have sort of reinvented the piece by adding an element of Nritta, using a Jati in the middle to sort of seamlessly blend the Nritta with the Abhinaya. So the Rijhana is you know, shown this way, the Rijhana could be shown this way, the Rijhana, see this is a new kind of a, uh, the Rijhana is always, like since it's two ways, 
So the Rijana is shown this way. So you can use it with the employment of the body movement. It could be a ditte, it could be a, a, you know, a little spin of the body because we are using that element of Nritta. The second uh, uh, thing that you said was about when you transfer the idea or the knowledge to the students, we try to see as much as possible to sort of give them an overview of the poetry. So it's not just one particular piece because then what happens is your description of or your even your, um, uh, your uh, depiction of that while you are dancing becomes very staccato. And it becomes very studied because you're only being taught, okay, do ditte, ditte, and then you come back. Whereas it's not that. It holds within that movement, holds within it the poetry itself. So you're doing the movement only to sort of enhance the poetic verse or the poetic expression and not the other way around. So giving them a little background of the Padavali, of Mira's philosophy in this case, becomes essential. And... It also is vital that you start taking up these pieces only once the student has some kind of a basic uh, sort of a training in Abhinaya. So once you have taught the Thai Shoda, the Tira the Vilayata Pillai, the, um, you know, the Gain Palli Kundiraya, the simpler pieces, not to say that they are in any way uh, simple, it's very tough to do a Thai Shoda, but it is only when they learn how to switch in and out of characters, which is the vital crux of Abhinaya, only then do we take up pieces where the words are limited, but the way you explore or expand them becomes vaster. So that is something that we sort of uh, keep in mind. The younger students are taught more descriptive pieces, like we have lovely uh, compositions of Surdasji, which are taught to the, you know, the 12, 13 year olds, Sundara Syama, Sundara Bara Leela, Sundara Bolata, Bachana Rasala. So trying to sort of minimize the uh, use of the abhinaya, but use more of the nritta or the body movements to enhance the verses. So there are different approaches to that. It depends primarily who is sitting there in front of you, who is your uh, sure. you know, target Have audience. Have you come yeah. across any term where you felt your dance vocabulary did not do justice to the flavor of that? Yes, there is a lovely um, composition, very good question. <laughs> There's a lovely composition of the poet Surdasji in... Um, his section on epiphany, which is the dramatic revelation, um, where Mother Yashoda is trying to pacify little Krishna by showing him the moon. So she tries to bring a bowl of water and shows the reflection of the moon and Krishna tries to hold it, but it obviously slips away and the baby starts crying. So she says, Tuva Mukha Dekhi Darata Sasi Bhari. Looking at your beautiful face, that moon has run away. It doesn't want to be in the hands of Hari. No way is it going to come in your hands. It's run away to the nether world. What else will that poor moon do? So in the end, there is a line which comes. Sunahu syama tumakau sasi darapata. Listen, O Krishna, the mother says. Looking at you, sasi is moon. Darapata, the moon is scared looking at you. Yaha kahata me sarana tumhari. That word sarana again has absolutely, I have not found out, um, uh, you can't say sharana kata, you can't say sharan, it's not charan. The moon is saying, yaha kahata me sarana tumhari. I have just surrendered. Even surrender I think is, I mean brings with it only that much as the word sort of uh, allows it to, but... Uh, the word saran has, saran has so many, um, so many wonderful possibilities which are all here. But then when you try to bring it out in dance, at the most the baby, like the way I have done it is when the baby is on uh, Yashoda's lap and she says, Suna hu syama, listen, oh Krishna, now it's time for you to sleep. That moon is scared of you. Yaha kahata me. Sarana Tumari, it wants to be at your feet, doesn't want to be in your hands. So that is at the most that we took the interpretation, that the moon is not wanting or cannot or just cannot afford to come in your uh, kara, in your hands, but wants to be at your sarana, wants to be at your feet. So we also end the piece by Krishna putting his feet into the water.
and going to sleep because he's, he at least feels the moon is there. And he's, he's able to see the moon when he has put his little feet into that. So there are times when, as you say, the poetic expression, the poetic um, possibilities is so immense. It's so much that you feel completely, you know, foxed, incapable of how to sort of bring that and translate it into dance vocabulary. And that is the beauty where the words are limited, but then there is so much that you can sort of weave through that in terms of your other. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the yeah, audience? Yes. Okay. Oh God, this is intimidating. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was lovely. I had uh, the opportunity to uh, give them a few sessions at uh, our camp at Tenangur. And this little girl here had been very <laughs> naughty, inquisitive, very curious, but very participating as well. Thank you for that lovely demonstration. I thought it would be interesting for uh, the students to know how you fit in the nritta segments. You were talking about inserting some jatis here, some swaras. What is the grammar that you would use there? Do you think the typical South Indian Bharatanatyam grammar would go hand in hand with those tunes. You were referring to the ragas. Yes. You know? So, uh, a wonderful question that Ak has asked. And uh, I just want to, at this point, um, maybe play a little segment because unfortunately I'm not dressed uh, to do the nritta. But yes, the jatis or the rhythmic patterns that we use are very much traditional uh, Bharatanatyam patterns. But then the idea or the thought behind that is how do we sort of knit it and weave it back into the poetry. So it can't be that you are doing a piece that sort of doesn't lend itself to nritta and you just sort of stuff the jati or the swaram in it because you want to show your prowess in jumping around. No. <laughs> yes. So in fact I have that Jati in this particular piece, the first part also had certain um, uh, sequences of nritta without the jatis, but where the nritta passages were sort of uh, linked to the dance and interestingly linked to that particular yedupu of the song, which was meto. So the word, the, the song actually goes as giridhara age na chungi meto. So we sort of gave the punch every time to the concluding nritta segment with meto giridhara age that way. So, just for you to... Oh, 
Thank you so much, Akka. Um, if there are more questions for Ragini Akka, we'll definitely have an opportunity to take it at the end of the session today when we open out for the interactive session. Um, please join me once again in thanking Srimati Ragini Chandrasekhar. Thank you.